What I, what I want to do is I want to take a, a lot of what has happened the last week and start to now put it together in a structure. Um, and how, how does this all now work? And so for those of you who are wanting like the nuts and bolts, this is kind of what it's going to start to feel like. Let's put like the wheels on the car and get this thing going. So uh, before I do that, though, I want to just, uh, I think I said this before, and I just want to re restate it if, I, if it didn't get heard. Um, it's important, again, that you define what a disciple is and then what discipleship is. Uh, because if the mission is making disciples, but you don't define disciple, and you don't define what making disciples means, then, then you'll just, I mean, what, what you'll end up doing is you'll end up doing none of it. You'll, I mean, you'll, you'll just be, it'll be like shotgun. You'll just try everything you can, and hopefully something works. And you'll, you'll waste a lot of energy, I think, and we'll be poor stewards of the resources God gives us. So I, the way that I have defined discipleship uh, for us, and I don't, hopefully it's not my idea, and I, I think I already said it uh, before, but just I'll say it again. Discipleship, meaning the process of making disciples, um, is increasingly leading people to increasingly bring all of life under the lordship and empowering presence of Jesus. So I, I, want, I want to say that because what we're going to talk about is how do we do that? And, uh, and then for me, a disciple, when we just find disciple... It's one who increasingly worships Jesus in all of life, is being changed by Jesus in all of life, and obeys Jesus in all of life, and then teaches others to do the same. So I've said that, I think, last time we were together, but I want to restate it again. Uh, the reason why I want to restate that is because uh, you have to ask, well, then what's required to be able to do that? Like, what kind of discipleship environment must you have so that disciples are made? And I... I believe it's got to be life on life, life in community, life on mission. So you've got to be able to see each other's life so it's life that's accessible and visible. You need to be able to watch them to see if they're bringing all of life under the lordship of Jesus Christ and his power, empowering presence. They need to see you to see what it looks like to do that in, in the home, in, you know, in the relationships you have, in the neighborhood. There's, if, it, if, it isn't prim, if discipleship isn't primarily cognitive understanding and regurgitation of doctrinal principles, which for a lot of people, that's what they think they mean when they make disciples, is could these people pass a theological exam, and are they engaged in the exercising of those spiritual disciplines? That's where a lot of people end with discipleship. It's like, do they have good doctrine, and can they do the spiritual disciplines? And the problem with that is, you could have both of those, and still not love your wife, and love your children, and you know, be, be a friend of unbelievers and make disciples who can make disciples. I mean, you can do all those other two things and still not accomplish the commission at all. And uh, so we've got to ask, well, how, how do we measure, or how do we create, a, not measure, how do we create an environment where we actually know that they're disciple makers? Well, you're going to have to be in life with them. And I won't spend any more time on that. Hopefully that's just apparent. You, you, can't, you can't know if they are if, unless you know them. Um, and second, it's got to be life and community because if it's, if it's just one-on-one -on -one discipleship, then you'll look like the one that's discipling you, not look like Jesus. In order to look like Jesus, you need to have a community discipling you. Um, and then third, it's got to be life on mission. You don't know if they, they won't know what it looks like to make disciples unless they're watching someone make disciples on the mission, which is Jesus' way of training his disciples. Well, he's on the mission, he's making disciples, and so by the time they're done, they know what it looks like to follow Jesus in all of life because he's been on mission with them for three years in all of life. So it's got to have those three things. So for us at least, and this is where we get to the why, are we, why have we concluded that missional communities are, as we state, the primary organizing structure for making disciples in the church. We've, why do we believe that? Because we believe there's not a better means by which people have life on life, life in community, and life on mission all together. Um, you could say, well, the church has lots of things that help people. We gather weekly, we teach, we do classes, they instruct, we do some one-on-one -on -one relationships, some people do small groups. And what happens is we, most of the church has broken up their discipleship strategy into all kinds of little silos that are disconnected. They're not working together. So it's like the person who's teaching the class is not in the person's life. Now, it's not wrong to teach a class 
and not be in their life, but it is wrong if the people who are learning in the class aren't in each other's lives. You know, so for instance, I'm doing training a lot here, and sometimes it's this kind of setting, but if I know those people aren't in life with other people who are learning the same thing and are going to actually go and apply it together and hold each other accountable for it, then I don't have any clue if they got really learned it. Because learning it doesn't mean they can state it back to me. Unfortunately, that's what most American schools do. They just test on proficiency on stating back what the teacher taught them, not whether or not they can do what they were taught to do. You know, that's, that's the problem. So a lot of our education model is seeped into the church, and so we just want to know, can they state back? So I've got to know that there's a group of people that are learning together, living together, on mission together. That's how we're going to know that we're making disciples. There's got to be uh, some continuity in the life of the people who are on mission together in both their learning and their practice. So I want all three, the way I'd say it is I want head, heart, hands in their development. I want them to know, I want them to believe, and I want them to do. And I want the know, believe, and do to be with a group of people who are knowing, believing, and doing together. Okay? So that's what we're after. And so for us, we just, you know, the missional community wasn't like a new program for us. We just didn't, we didn't have any other idea on how we could call people to live the mission together, life on life, life in community, life on mission, other than something like a, what we now call a missional community. It was really us wrestling with us seeing what God was doing as we looked at his church in, throughout scripture and going, there is some kind of proximity, some kind of regularity, some kind of personal knowledge of one another. Paul can say, you know, when he leaves Ephesus, you know how I lived amongst you. You saw my life. You know, there was, a, there was a real connection to the life of Paul. Paul didn't stay in an office all week long and then show up and preach on Sunday and then go back and live his life in isolation. He lived in such a way that they knew what it looked like to follow Jesus in all of life. And that's the paradigm for disciple-making is Jesus could say the same thing, that they saw him in all of life. And that's why we can have the account that the gospel writers have given us of Christ's life because it wasn't Jesus just preaching and then Jesus living a life of isolation. It was Jesus living a life amongst so they could see it. So that's where we landed with it. I just wanted to give you that kind of that background before we get to unpacking what it is. Yes? Can you uh, define a disciple again? I missed that. So a disciple is one who's increasingly worshiping Jesus in all of life, being changed by Jesus in all of life. Okay, remember uh, Matthew 28, they came and they worshiped him, but some doubted, so they're in process. Then he says, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's their new identity. So Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. They're now new. They're be, it's establishing their new identity. So um, being changed by Jesus in all of life and obeying Jesus in all of life and then teaching others to do the same. So it's worship, transformation, obedience, if you want to put headings on it. And, I, and again, what you're hearing there is there's a kind of a head, heart, hands. Okay, I'm seeing, we're beginning to see all who God really is, and it's changing, you know, we're worshiping him for all that he really is. That's changing who we really are, and that's going out into what we really do. So it's, it's all three. It's a posture of, uh, and it, I said it earlier, it's the kind of upward, inward, outward approach to discipleship. Upward worship, inward being changed by Jesus, outward obeying him and teaching others to do the same. Okay? Does that help? Yeah. So like when, we, when people go, well, how do you know if someone's a disciple? Jesus says by their love. That's an outward thing. But the reality is, is you, don't get, you don't start loving people outwardly until you see God as a loving Father who sent his Son to show us his love. So that's an upward thing. That's a worship. As we come to know him as Father who sent his Son to love us dearly, it changes us internally because he pours the love of the, of the Father, the Spirit pours the love of the Father into our hearts. So we have a worship of God, an internal transformation. We're becoming loving people, and therefore it works itself out in loving one another. So it's upward, inward, outward. And, and every aspect of, like, when we talk about serving the least of these, it's because you worship Jesus as king who served you, and you were the least of these. You continue to remember that you had nothing, and the Spirit keeps reminding you of your poverty apart from Jesus. And so therefore you go out and serve others out of the riches that Jesus poured into your life. So it's always upward, inward, outward. And, and therefore, in order to have a kind of a discipleship environment, you've got to be able to go, okay, do we worship him in all of life? Well, I don't know. I don't know your life. So the only way I'm going to know is if I get to see how you spend your money. 
and love your wife and your kids. And so when we go out on to eat together and you're not generous in your tipping, I already know what you think about God's generosity to your life because you aren't generous to anybody. So that's an area that now I need to help work on your, in discipleship because discipleship is increasingly bringing all of life under the lordship and empowering presence of Jesus. So at that point, now I'm going to go, let's talk about how the gospel has affected your finances and your generosity. But most people don't know each other's financial life. I mean, how many people in your church have their books open to a bunch of other people who are discipling them? You know, and they show them their budget and their, their, their giving and their savings and their, like, that's almost, I mean, in fact, it, it means, whenever I say that in a church, people are like, that's the one thing you don't get to touch. You could talk to me about my sex life. You know, like, I shouldn't be looking at porn. I get that. And you can talk to me about that. When you talk to me about my money, you don't get to talk to me about that. And I'm like, you're going, really? Jesus talked about money more than anything else. He highlights the, the widow who gives all that she has in front of everybody. So she gave her entire life savings right there. And he says it out loud in front of everyone. You know, so it's like, it's creating an environment where that can happen. You know, when people are making decisions about a house, what they're going to buy, or a car they're going to purchase, or a job they're going to take, or the fact that they feel called to leave, did they do that in community in such a way that people can see if, the, if Christ is actually Lord over that part of their life or not? So you've got to have an environment where that can happen. Otherwise, you're not making disciples. Okay, so I think that's fundamentally the biggest challenge in front of the, the North American church is that we have, we have built a church uh, that, that leads to a greater isolation and separatist um, kind of approach. So people can have their, their separate lives and have their spiritual life, and those are not crossing over. You know? Now, in other parts of the world, that's not possible. But there, it's certainly possible here. So we gotta, we got to break that one down. So how do you do that? I think, that's, I think for us, missional community is one of the ways that we're going to do that is Get a group of people who are going to be together, life on life, life in community, life on mission. And I want to just def define it here. Uh, you, you, this is in your notes. I probably will follow the notes a little bit better. Um, uh, we, the way we've, I, I want to give the short definition of it. That isn't in your notes because I think it's, it's easy. It's, it's memorable. We've already said it before. Um, a missional community is a family of missionary servants sent as disciples who make disciples. Hopefully it's all coming together now. You see it in here, we, we, we pack, unpack it a little bit more. A mission of community is a gospel community, that's that family that lives out the mission of God together, that's the missionary identity. And in particular to a particular area or people group. And I would say if you have a missional community and there's no defined people group, then you don't have a missional community. You have a community. It's missional when there's a group of people that feel called to go reach and make disciples of. If all they have is a group of people who study mission and do service projects, that's not a missional community. That's a caring community that does service. A missional community has a people they believe they're sent to to make disciples of. Okay, So they're a family, missionaries, they have a particular people group, and they're going to demonstrate the gospel in tangible forms and declare the gospel out of that. That's that servant identity. So it's not just we love one another like family and we're sent as missionaries to a people group, but we're going to show what the kingdom of God looks like as we serve them in tangible ways. And then we're going to tell them about Jesus because it's the only way to explain why we would do the things we do. So we're going to tell them about the message of our king, which is the gospel. So then they're going to explain it and expose them to the gospel through both deed and then word. And that's that kind of disciple identity. A disciple is one who makes disciples of Jesus. We proclaim the gospel so they might come to faith in Jesus, believe in him, follow him, and do the same as we've been doing. Okay? So the short version of that is a missional community is a family of missionary servants sent as disciples who make disciples. Now to clarify what it is not primarily. It's not primarily a small group. And the reason we say that is because we live, and, and this may not be as important for the international context, and maybe it is, I don't know, but we live in a culture and day where the church put together what they call small groups as a, as a way to close the back door of the church. It's like, okay, we know that the gathering doesn't feel like you belong, so let's create a small group so you feel like you belong, so you won't leave. I mean, in a lot of ways, that was the reason. 
Okay, if we're, I mean, I was in the, in the days of the church growth movement having those conversations. They're like, how do we close the door? People are coming and leaving because they don't feel like they belong. Well, small groups is the way to do it. And so what was the primary focus of small groups? Who was it about? Us. Yeah, it was the church people who already belonged to the church. It was to give them a place where they could meet together. They could experience closer community you know, pray for one another. And I mean, those are all good things. Please don't hear me saying that's bad. It's just that became the primary goal was it's kind of supplemental to what the big church gathering can't do. So it supplements the weakness of the bigger gathering. Okay, the bigger gathering can, you can learn God's word. You can be reminded that, you know, and largely the mission of the church was get them to the gathering to hear the preaching of the word and then get them into a small group so they don't leave. That's primarily what small groups, in, in the 80s, 70s and 80s, when that became really popular, that was why they did it. If you do much study, that was the reasoning behind it. It wasn't a, we see a biblical paradigm of people living together on mission, in, and this is the biblical paradigm, and well, it's a smaller group, people really know one another. That wasn't the real reason. It was more pragmatic in nature. Now, it's had evolution through the last you know, 20 years that it's, it's changing, and I think it's even led to this conversation that we're having this week. But it's, we would say it's not primarily that. Second, it's not primarily a Bible study. Okay, you should study the Bible, but, but I don't, when, even when you read in Acts 2, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Remember, they didn't have a Bible. There was no printing press. So what did that mean? We hear that and we impose on it our present understanding, and we imagine a bunch of people sitting in a room together with a Bible, and they're reading it and talking about it. That's not what they were doing. They were saying, what did, what did Peter just say that we were supposed to be about in the world? Jesus and his mission. Okay, let's devote ourselves to that. Let's go be a faithful to his mission. They, they, devotion meant obey the words Jesus gave us. And the apostle's job was to pass it on so the church would know what to go be and do. It was not sitting around talking about it. Like the, the idea that they would have had these end, unending Bible studies for the, I mean, it, it just wouldn't happen. You know, it was like, okay, we're going to talk about, remember, Jesus died on the cross for our sins, rose again on the third day. Okay, now go tell the world about it. Let's go get devoted to the apostles' teaching. It was an active participation in the mission of God. That's what devotion looked like. It wasn't sitting around talking about it. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do Bible studies. I'm just saying we have got a lot of work to, to get the Christian, especially in North America, out of the mindset that Christianity looks like studying the Bible. That's not what it means. That's what, that's what like, theologians like to do. Okay, and I'm not anti-theologians. I, I'm a theologian. We're all theologians. But we should say like, a Bible study is, is not effective if people don't obey it. You know, like I, what I'll regularly say to people like when they come to Soma, like, man, where are all your Bible studies? And I say, well, we, the way we do Bible study is we want to obey the word of God. And if you don't know it, then we want to help you know it so you can go obey it. But if you already know it, we're not going to sit around and talk about it forever. So I'll say, like, for instance, what was the last Bible study you sat in? And, uh, you know, I love it if they say James because it just sets me up so perfectly. You know, I mean, it, you can do it with any book. It doesn't really matter. James, okay. Oh, I'm so glad you're here because we have a lot of orphans and widows in this city. And obviously you've been prepared really well to care for orphans and widows because you studied James. Because that's what the word of God is for, is to train you up so the worker is prepared to do the work. That's the point of scripture. It's profitable for teaching for what? Righteousness. Yeah, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. What is righteousness according to the scriptures? It's actually being and doing what God saved you to be and do. Okay? That's what, that's what understanding, it's like we are living the way he meant us to live. Now, the good news in the gospel is even when you don't, our righteousness is in Christ. We're, we're justified by his perfect obedience to the word. But he certainly didn't want to save a bunch of people who just go around and go, we don't want to do anything God told us to do. We just want to study what God told us to do and trust that Jesus already did it so we don't have to do anything. That's, that's, a, that's a false gospel, okay? The gospel isn't so that you'd be saved to disobey. It's so that you might be saved to obey. That's the whole point of it, okay? So 
Obedience is the goal of Bible study. It's that we might get to know Jesus, be just amazed with his goodness and grace, and then because we love him so much, we obey his commandments. Jesus says, if you obey me, or if you love me, you will obey my commandments. So that's what we're leading people towards. So yeah, you should study the Bible, but it should be the doing of the Bible. Jesus says he who hears these words and does not do them is like the foolish person who builds his house on the sand. Whoever hears these words, however, and puts them into practice is like the wise man who builds his house on the rock. What is he saying there? He's the rock. You're building your life on him. When you obey his words, you're saying you trust him. You believe in him. You are all about Jesus. To, to study his word and not want to obey it is to actually not be about Jesus. You're the fool. And the crazy thing is, is I think in our churches, we have actually said the more Bible you know, the more spiritually mature you are. It's just the opposite. The more Bible you know and don't obey, the more foolish you are and more accountable to God for disobeying his word. And there's a part of me that wants to go like, stop studying the Bible because we haven't even been obedient to any of it yet. Like, don't give them more reason to stand before God and have to give an account for the way that they rejected his word. Okay, I, I think we need to be much more sober-minded about giving people another Bible study after another Bible study when they didn't obey the last one. And I think, it's, I think as, as spiritual leaders, we ought to really cause, we, it's a cause for pause and say, wait a minute, are we informing people that godliness looks like disobedience to the word? As long as you know it, that's all that matters. No, obey the word. So, yeah, we want to study the Bible, so we might obey. And I would much rather have Bible study happen in the midst of obedience and struggle and mission and community falling apart because you guys all know this, the way people learn best is in the middle of the mess. That's how they learn. Like, Jesus' disciples are hungry to learn once they come back and realize they don't know how to deal with demons. Now there's a good reason to teach on Bible study on how, what, what demons are all about. Now, you want a captive audience? Put them on a mission, have them deal with a bunch of demons, and come back and go, what does the Bible say about how we deal with demons? They will study their Bibles, I promise you. It will be an entirely different hunger for God's Word. In fact, here's how I like to look at um, training people. Uh, most people, you, you may not realize this, but most people don't learn unless they believe they have to learn. Okay? So what we, our job is, is we want to move people from unconscious incompetence, okay, they don't know that they don't know. Okay, this is where, by the way, some of you this week, this is what's happening to you. You're going, oh my goodness, there's a lot of things I've never thought through before. I, I did a residence class yesterday on biblical theology and seeing the Bible as a whole story and how do you run the themes of key themes like kingdom and land and sacrifice and all that through the entire story of the Bible. So you learn how to see the Bible as a whole. And, and there was one couple that was sitting in, the, in our training came to me afterwards and just said, we feel so overwhelmed because there's so much we don't know. We've never realized how, we just realized how little of the gospel we get, how little of the Bible we get. Like, we don't, this is, this is super overwhelming for us. Well, what happened was they became aware that they don't know. And for a lot of people, this is a, a really... This is a thing that they almost don't want because we are, some of our self-righteousness is, is, is in connected to feeling like we know everything. And as soon as you don't know something, you're like, oh, I feel disoriented. I thought I was, I mean, I, it's, it's similar to, uh, well, th this same couple said, like, there's so many other, I said, are, what are you feeling? And they said, we're feeling uncomfortable. I said, why? And uh, the wife especially said, because what else don't we know? We've been in the church all our life. And we're realizing there's so little that we actually know what we assumed we had it all figured out. Well, you want to, I mean, this is, by the way, the book of Mark. That's part of what is happening as Mark is writing. He's showing that the disciples didn't know. Even to the end, they didn't know. You know, they were so unaware of what they didn't know. But they get to know it later. Okay, so you want to lead them from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence. In other words, you want them to realize, I really don't know. Okay, you guys, how many of you guys ever see uh, the movie Matrix? Okay, so all those people don't know they're not really living in the world that they think they're in. They're just plugged into a machine. The machine is a, a, 
is basically that we've got human batteries running the computer-generated wor world that everybody thinks they're living in, and it's not real until they get pulled out of the machine, and then they realize that whole world was fake. And now they're consciously aware of their incompetence. They don't know how to do anything. You know, Neo, who comes out of it, hardly knows how to walk. Uh, he doesn't know how, so they have to do a whole training regiment. Now, wouldn't it be cool if you could stick a thing in the back of your head and everything would just be downloaded into you? Like, and now you can actually do it, but we don't have that. So he's, he's aware that he doesn't know how to live in the world that he actually belongs to because he's been living plugged into a machine in a virtual world that doesn't exist. Well, this is, by the way, a lot of the church. They, they don't realize they don't know how to live on mission in this world. They really don't. And they, and they won't know until you get them out in it. And conscious incompetence takes place when you give them exposure to truth and experience. So what you're doing is you're showing them, you got to put them in a place where they go, oh my goodness, I've never heard this before. Or, oh my goodness, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. And so you've got to give them exposure and experience. You got a lot of exposure this week. You got a little bit of experience. You hung out with some people. You got to hear what they're going through in their mission. You, you got to sit in a, you know, like a music thing where we we're trying to do mission to artists. And you did stuff with sake. I mean, there's a lot of exposure you got uh, and a little bit of experience. Uh, if, if I were going to develop you, if you were coming on our wing, I'd say, go on mission with me for a year or so. And then, then I'll, I'll, we'll help you understand there's a lot that you don't know, okay? Now, that's true of me, too. I'm not saying I know everything. There's, God keeps exposing me to new things and putting me in new experiences, and I'm like, wow, I had no idea how to deal with that, okay? So you want to create places for that, and I think the mission community is a great place for that because when you say, hey, here's a group of people. We have to go reach them with the gospel. Most Christians are like, I don't have a clue what to do. You go, how long have you been in the church? Oh, 30 years? How is that possible? But it's all over the place. So we've got to find a way to get experience and exposure to reveal what they don't know. And then we want to move them to conscious competence. That's where they're actually practicing. This is practice of belief. Another way to think of it is they need lots of rep repetitions of something in light of what they believe. So, you know, you want to get people to learn how to be gospel fluent where they can share the gospel in all of life. Put them in a place where it's expected that the only answer we get to give is the gospel. Okay, and then that, your mission communities know that that's normative. A group of people regularly speaking the gospel to all the issues of life. So when a problem comes in the group and someone goes, hey, you know, I got like three great principles on how to have a great financial life. And you go, wait a minute, hold on. What does the gospel say about our finances? And everyone goes... I don't know. Okay, let's do it. Let's talk about the gospel for finances. And people go, okay, this is uncomfortable. I'm not sure what that means. How do you do that? And this is the most uncomfortable place of learning, by the way. This is that place where you're, you're learning new muscles. You're, you're like learning new movements. I don't know if you ever learned how to golf, but golf is a fairly awkward thing when you first learn it. Because you, you think, well, just step up and just swing the thing. I mean, that's, won't that work? It doesn't work. You've got to have right posture and, you know, there's all this stuff, you know, like that and make sure that stays straight when you come back. You know, I mean, there's all these movements you've got to perfect and it's a very high precision game. And so to learn how to golf for the first probably several years, it's super, super uncomfortable until you get your muscles into muscle memory and you just step up and do it. And what you want to do is you want to move from conscious competence to unconscious competence. In other words, you get to a place where you don't even know you're doing it anymore. If you ever watch great athletes, every once in a while people yell out, that guy's unconscious. Well, what do they mean? They mean Michael Jordan, when he did what he did, just did, does it. He's just amazing. He doesn't think about it. He's been doing it for so long, it's muscle memory. And that, that's what the church is supposed to be. We're supposed to be unconsciously competent, that we are living as gospel-centered people in all of life to the point at which it's not, it's not hard work to keep figuring out how to be God's people. But I'll tell you, moving from here to here is extremely painful. Okay, getting to this point where it just happens because that's how God's people live is some of the hardest work. And most people do like Cypher did in Matrix. Remember, he goes... He's like, I just want to go back into the machine. 
It's just a lot easier to be plugged in and not do anything and have everything done. And so what does he do? He's like literally eating the steak in the virtual world. And he goes, I know this isn't really steak. So he's consciously aware of the fact that he doesn't want to live in this world, but he'd rather go back to this. And I think that's what happens to a lot of church people. You're going to find this, by the way, as you lead people out on a mission, they're going to go, it was just a lot easier to live in this world where I just show up, someone does it for me, I go home, I tithe, I kind of just do the bare minimum. The idea of getting really competent in being a disciple-making disciple, it's super hard work. And yeah, and it depends, it, it's going to require the spirit. It's going to require a resource outside of myself. I, I just want to go back. I can't tell you how many people that I've helped transition to missional communities, once they realized they couldn't do uh, disciple-making in the way that they had been doing church before, they call me up and they're like, I just wish I never met you. You know, I just wish that I, w- I just wish I didn't know because it'd be so much easier to go back to just running Sunday and then kind of living in my office and studying and doing business meetings and all that. That's so much easier than getting a group of people that are, are the church to actually be on mission in all of life. This is hard. Well, it's because they're in this zone right now. And, it's, and, and I'll just tell you, like, you're not going to get to this unless you have a place in which it's normative to keep doing it over and over and over and over again. Back to a mission community is not primarily a Bible study. Bible studies don't do this. I want to be really clear. Bible studies do this. They might move you from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence where you go, okay, I know that I don't live like this and I know that I don't know this, but where it usually ends is let's keep talking about it and let's move on to the next book. Because at least we know what we're not, and we know what we don't do, and we know what we should do, and now we know. So we're conscious, and that's it. But we don't train them for every good work, see that, so that the worker might be fully equipped. That's what Paul says to Timothy. That's our job, is to get them to hear, so eventually they're here. That's our job. So Bible study is important, but it, it will not get you to hear unless you put it into practice. And you need a place and a people to put into practice with. Okay? Make sense? Third, it's not primarily a support group. And by that we mean um, if it continually exists for the members themselves, then it's a codependent group. And a lot of support groups exist for the brokenness of the members and never get the members to turn outward to care for someone other than themselves. And so there may be times when it needs to be more support in nature because you have a lot of brokenness. But if it stays only supporting one another, you'll never get healthy. And it's kind of like the Alcoholics Anonymous thing. Like as long as you keep identifying yourself as an alcoholic, then you're still not healthy. Alcoholics Anonymous need to go beyond being identified as we're a bunch of people who struggle with drinking to we're a group of people who don't struggle with drinking anymore. We're free. Now we can go out and help others who struggle with drinking. And I'm not an alcoholic. Hi, I'm Jeff. I'm a child of God. Okay? But when you define yourself by your brokenness and your sin, you'll never have anything to bring to anybody that's going to get them out of the, the wrong definition of themselves. We don't define ourselves by our sin. We define ourselves by Jesus and what he's done and who we are in Christ. And so that moves from support to uh, being gospel-centered people who are sent. And that's a sh- significant shift. But a lot of people continue to meet together at, around their brokenness and their need, and they're, they're, still, they're still worshiping the wrong God, as it were. So we want to take them from that to being an outward group that gets to serve others with the new work God's done in their life. So that they might support others out there, but they won't just keep supporting each other inside. That makes sense? A fourth, it's not primarily a social activist group. It was interesting. I was interviewed uh, last week at, uh, at Exponential, did a video interview, and it, uh, or it was like panel discussion is what it was. And one of the guys said, like, you know, I know, I know missional is really, um, you know, it's like, it's, it's the new, it's kind of the new fad. That's how he framed it. And, uh, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's like small groups was a big fad in the, the 90s. And, you know, there was the church growth movement and the seeker movement. And he was laying out all these different fads. He said, and now missional community is like the new fad. It's like, it's kind of like a group of people who know they should be about social justice and they want to get out and serve the poor and the broken. And, and as he's describing, I'm like, he goes, and I know you're part of that. You're kind of like one of the leading uh, voices in the missional community movement. And I stopped and I said, wait a minute. What you just described, I'm not a part of that. 
Like, I don't know. I don't know why you lump me in with that group because I'm not that group. Uh, what I'm a part of is I believe God has saved us so that we would be on the mission of making disciples in every aspect of life. That's what I think missional means. I don't think it's a new fad. I think it's from the beginning of Jesus saving his people. From the very beginning of Pentecost, God powered his people to be sent into everything so he, they would be about the mission of making disciples in all of life. I, I think we should be about social justice, but I don't think that's the ultimate mission. The ultimate mission is making disciples of Jesus, and we're always doing it all the time. That's what I think missional means. And he's like, really? I'm like, you're, you're, the problem is, is you're listening to a big conversation going on right now, and I know a lot of people are making mission social justice. And I would say that's not the mission. That's one of the things we do while we're on mission, to show the kingdom of God breaking into the world. But the ultimate mission is making disciples of Jesus, who does care about justice. Uh, so he was like, wow, that's news to me. I'm like, yeah, we got to redefine this. And, and the reason why is because I think a lot of people think a mission of community is just a group of people who do some social activism together. And what they've done is they made the project the mission instead of the people. So it's like, and that, by the way, that'll slip into all your mission of community thinking as they'll go, hey, we, we, we're all on mission. We have a missional community. And I, I remember meeting in, with a group down in L.A. And they said, we're all about mission. We have a missional community. I said, really? Who's your mission? And they said, well, we're the homeless people down in L.A. I said, you live, you live in the suburbs. And they happen to live in one of the safest suburbs. I wouldn't even call it L.A. Um, it may be one of the safest places in the whole country from what I've heard about the place. So I said, so your mission is downtown Skid Row, L.A., homeless. Yeah. Where do you live? Out there. That's not your mission. That's a service project. So now I'm not saying it's, it's, bad, it's, it's a bad thing to go feed the homeless. I think it's great. But that's not your mission. Because you're not living there. You're not amongst them. You're not making disciples of them. You're not living in their rhythms in such a way that they would know what it looks like to follow Jesus as a homeless person in L.A. You're just doing kind works of justice, which are good, but that isn't your mission. The mission is actually the people that are driving with you to L.A. and driving back. Those are the disciples that you're probably making into disciples, and it's probably back in your hometown, and you just happen to be doing some good works of service and justice, so they understand that our God is, cares about the poor. And that's a good thing, but the poor are not your mission. Until you're committed to making disciples of them in all of life, they're not your mission. They're an active, they're an action of, of your mission, caring for the poor. Does that make sense? Like, so, the, by the way, this will be a big, a lot of people go like, yeah, we're, we have a missional community. We do this one project once a month with a group of people. That's not mission. Okay. And then it's not primarily, and this will be one that you'll, you'll want to work through. It's not primarily a weekly meeting. I guarantee you, even as we've been talking this week and probably even today as we go through stuff, some of your questions are going to be like, okay, so how do you, like whenever people go like, what do you do with kids? What they're asking is, what do you do with kids for a couple hours on a Wednesday night? They're not usually asking, what do you do with kids all week long? And I, I mean, most people, if I said, well, what, I mean, I don't know that I'd ever have to sit down with you as a parent and go like, so what do you guys do with your kids? You'd be like, what do you, what do you mean, what do we do with our kids? We feed them, we clothe them, we, we mentor them, we take care of them, we go on vacations with them, we play with them, we go to their sporting activities, we tutor them, we make sure they're doing their homework well. Like, You'd all know what to do with kids. But that question usually is, what do we do with kids for a couple hours when we're trying to get every part of our mission accomplished in one weekly meeting? And I can't answer that question because there's no way to answer that question. You can't. You can't make disciples of kids and adults and unbelievers in two hours a week. Does that make sense? But I guarantee you people are going to slip back into meeting mentality because that's how we've defined the church. It is so ingrained into our culture that we go to church. In other words, you go to a meeting and there's church. And I'll even hear people, hear people say like, man, we had good church today. And what they meant was good worship or good teaching or a good experience. And already we've undermined the very nature of what it means to be the church by that very statement. Because the church is not an event. The church is God's people on his mission in the world, saved by the power of the gospel. That's, his, that's what the church is. And so as soon as you define it as an event, you've, you've reduced it to a very small sliver of life. 
And people, by the way, will do the exact same thing with the missional community. You probably even heard it even amongst us. I mean, I'm constantly correcting people here where they'll, they'll go, I'll ask, how's your missional community? And they're like, well, no one shows up and, you know, no one brings food and sometimes we don't know what to do. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Are you talking about your weekly meeting where you have a meal? Yeah. Well, that's not your missional community. Your missional community is the people. How are they doing? Are they on mission? Do they have friends who are unbelievers? Are you guys in the rhythm of each other's lives? What does the week look like for you? I don't want to know how your, your meeting's going. I want to know how your people are doing. Just like if I said, how's your church? And you said, oh man, attendance is really up. Numbers are great. Worship is awesome. Preaching's amazing. You just define to me how your event's going. I want to know how your church is doing. Tell me about your people. Are they on mission? Are they growing in discipleship? Are they changing? Is the city being affected? Is all of, all of life being changed because of the gospel and being poured into God's people? Like, the church is the people. It's not the event. But I guarantee you, in this conversation, and even today, you'll, you'll be working super hard to break your paradigm because you're going to ask questions about uh, an, an event instead of a people. Okay, so I'm trying to actually... I've done this enough times to know where we're going this afternoon. So when we do q and I know where, where it's going to... It's okay to ask, what do you do in the weekly meeting? But let's be clear. Let's define it that way. What do you do when the people of God meet for a little, few hours? Not what do you do with your missional community, and you're really talking about a two-hour meeting. Are you getting it yet? I mean, this, by the way, this, is gonna be, this will be one of the hardest things you do, is breaking the paradigm of church as event versus church as people. Okay. And then last, the mission of community is not primarily an affinity group. Now, you'll find if you hung out with a lot of us, it may start as affinity group. It may flow into kind of affinity group approach. And what I mean by affinity group is like you go, okay, we're, we're going to start an artist missional community for songwriters. Well, that's an affinity group. And we've done that. And it's not wrong to start it with affinity as long as the, there's a mission. You know, instead of going like, hey, we just want to hang out with all the single, single uh, or have young marrieds or young marrieds with kids group. Like as soon as you define it as the people who are in the group versus the people who are trying to reach, you've already shut down the mission. Instead of going like, no, we want to reach young parents with kids. That's our mission. And that is an affinity group. But guaranteed, once you start to reach them, they're connected to people who aren't young parents with kids. Their coworkers, their friends, their neighbors. Like, eventually it's going to go from affinity to diversity. That's how the kingdom of God always works. And that's the movement of the story of God. It starts with a, a, a affinity, Israel, and it goes to the nations. So it's okay to start with a people group so the mission gets started somewhere. But to stay with an affinity group means you probably haven't made mature disciples because they're just gathering around themselves people that are just like them. So eventually there should be all different ages and socioeconomic. It should reflect the culture that you're probably in more than just the culture you started with. That makes sense? So um, our artists, for example, when they started their mission of community for songwriters, they said we want to develop people who want to develop their craft in songwriting. And so they pulled people together and said we're going to teach them how to write songs. And each week we're going to go through one of the parts of the story of God. Start with creation, then go through fall. And so each week they went through a story. Then they were to write a song in reflection to that story, believers and unbelievers. And then they would perform that song for the group the next week. And then they'd give feedback to that and help them develop it. And then they would do an artist showcase like you guys saw Friday night. Though that wasn't, that was, that came out of what I'm describing a few years ago. And they would then play their songs publicly in a public setting, like the, the Shaka Bra or in a pub or whatever. And, and then they would support each other in that songwriting. Eventually they recorded, and that's our two albums, our story albums that came out of that whole process. Um, but they would also then go, well, if songwriters are our, our emphasis, we should also be making space for them to do house shows. And when a new band comes into town, we'll support that new band, and we'll go buy their records when we go to the to hear them play at the clubs and we'll make sure we eat a lot of food and tip super well so that the restaurants will bring them back because that's why people bring bands in. They don't bring them in because they want music. They bring them in because they want to make money. And musicians bring in followers and followers buy food and followers make money for the business. Okay? So we, they knew all that. So like we've got to make our whole mission about songwriters, but it's going to include all those kinds of activities. 
And, and then eventually as they led more and more people to the ways of Jesus, they started to grow up more and more mature. And some of those people said, hey, we would like to go reach like our, our friends that aren't musicians and artists. And so all of a sudden it went from affinity to diversity as they grew up into becoming disciple makers themselves. Does that make sense? So it's, uh, it might start there, but it shouldn't stay there. Any questions before I move on to how do you begin to now form these and lead these? I'm, that was just me and my job of defining it so that it frames it. Yeah. Uh, I realize this question is on a sliding scale, but uh, how long does it typically take to go from affinity to diversity in terms of or I mean, I know that's a silly I really don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think that anytime people ask me questions of uh, timelines, I can tell you like a general, a general kind of thing. Like I would say it, whether it's the affinity question or just in general, how do you get a group of people to actually start to be on mission effectively to people other than just people like themselves? I think it's two to three years for some, in some cases. I'll tell you what, if you're working with church people, it will take them one year to break down their paradigm, a second year to, to build up one, and a third year to get good at practicing it. That's been my experience with most church people. It's like a three-year process until they're effectively getting it and on mission. I know that might be discouraging to you, but that's what it took for Jesus too uh, with his disciples. So, you know, just breathe easy and realize you're not that be much better than him. So <laughs> we, we know we're not better than him, obviously. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, like, when people who are part of the missional community are, like, they're people group that they're really on mission to is different. So if they all have a different group of people within the same mission community? Yeah, that's going to have to... Yeah, so um, if it's okay, I'm going to save that, okay? for Because we're going to get to how do you define mission and how do you help people get on the same mission? So if it's okay, I'm going to save that until then. Yeah. So, um, so with affinity, you're not saying that affinity is a bad thing. You're just saying yeah, what I'm saying is, and the reason why I said I start the definition, it's not primarily, that's key word, primarily. So I say it's not primarily a small group. It is a small group, but it's not primarily a small group. When I say it's not primarily a Bible study, you're going to study the Bible. But that's not all you're going to do. When we say it's not primarily an affinity group, we're saying it's not only about affinity. Where a lot of churches have said, well, you guys, you know, youth are over here and college are over here and singles are over And, like, we divided up the body of Christ in a way that God never intended to be divided up. We're supposed to be together with the older and the younger and the, the people who aren't like us. So health will look like it's going to grow into a diversity. But you may go, there's a group of people we're trying to reach, and they're a lot alike. And that's just the reality of mission. You know, when Paul felt called to a particular place, it was a particular kind of people. And, you know, he, whenever he'd go, he'd start in the synagogue because there was a lot of affinity around God's word. They were God-fearers, so he started there. But then he went out from that. And so mission always goes from a sort of affinity to a non-affinity eventually. That's just the way that the whole story goes as well. Yeah. What do you think about missional communities forming around um, a common geography, people living in a certain place? Yeah, so the question is, like, do we form it around geography, people living in a certain place? Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. How do, you, how do you define mission? And this is part of your question, too. They, they kind of overlap a little bit, but that is a little different. <clears throat> I'd say fundamentally you've got to ask how are people organized in the place we're going to. So like in San Francisco, very clearly defined neighborhoods. And you are defined by that. Philly, even more so. People don't even go out of certain parts of the town in Philadelphia. Some have never left it. Literally. So if you're going to reach them, you're going to have to live in that, eat in the same places, shop in the same places, hang out in the same... I mean, it's, that's how you're going to reach it. Here in Tacoma, you can get anywhere in about 10 minutes. So it's not as easily defined geographically. And we tried to make it much more geographic here, and then we realized there's lots of networks within this town that spend tons of time together as though they live next door. So it all depends. L.A., you're going to have to get a little regional because you, people won't drive from Burbank to Culver City. It takes two hours, three hours to get there, you know, depending on traffic. So each area is different. You'll have to wrestle with how much does geography play into our 
convictions about mission um, because sometimes geography is a great way to define it. Sometimes it's not. And I'd, I'd learn from church history here, like um, especially like the Anglican church and other others who followed in their, in their pattern where they define clear boundaries of what you get to work within and you don't get to go across the boundary because that's somebody else's parish or whatever it is that the, I don't know what they call it. But, um, and so what they end up doing is they actually shut down the, the organic nature of mission that does cross over into new territory. And, and so they, they actually have killed them, shot themselves in the foot in their church planning movements because if you all of a sudden have a guy that feels called to go to another place, you can't oversee him anymore because he's got to come under another head who he doesn't know, doesn't trust. And so what they do is they end up leaving the <coughs> Anglican church to go plant churches elsewhere. So you've got to be careful that GR, and this, Willow Creek made the same mistake. They brought in Randy Frazee, who was great at neighborhoods, and where he came from, it was very clearly defined, and he went into Chicago suburbs and said, like, if they live across the street on this boundary, they don't get to be in the same community group. So they literally defined it by streets, and they had to then decide, well, then, do you only talk to people that live on this side of the street? What about people across the street? No, no, that's the boundary line. And so they, they, they actually hurt their entire strategy because they didn't allow permeability to happen in mission, which plays a little bit into what your question was in terms of, you know, multiple missions, like, um, I'll, but I'll come back to it. Um, and that is, there needs to be at least some consistency of a people we're trying to reach, but not so narrowly defined that we don't have room for God to, to bring people into our mission that we didn't plan for. So and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned how Paul went to the synagogues first. Uh, like in our context with all these different uh, languages and religions and nationalities, if we were to like you know, restart a church and have a, our small group, would it, would it be like wise to go towards people who are already closer to us in the sense of understanding who God is, understanding um, something about Christianity? Maybe they may not be there yet, but uh, kind of try to reach the, that low-hanging fruit first to build a, a community before going after really hardcore people like Muslims and Hindus, which will take 20 years to reach instead of two years. I don't know how to answer that question because that's like, a spirit-led thing in terms of who do we go after. Um, but I would say if you're called to a particular people group, you should go after the ones who are most open at first. And that's just kind of that person of peace principle that Jesus says, go and find a person who will take you in. And if they would listen and want more, then stay with them. But if not, move on. I think sometimes we, we are mar like we're kind of foolish martyrs in that we go, I know nobody wants to hear this and everyone's against it, but I'm not giving up on them until they, they respond. I'd go like, Hey, keep praying that they will, but keep looking for one or two people who have an open ear because the Spirit of God is moving somewhere. Try to discern where he's opening a door for the gospel to be preached. That's why Paul says, pray that a, the door might be open. If there's no open doors. You've got to keep going until you get an open door. And I think sometimes we don't follow the Spirit's uh, direction and we go, well, that's a closed door. I'm just going to keep knocking on until it opens. And the Spirit's going, i got another door over here. Why don't you go there? And so... I think teaching people to pay attention to where the Spirit's moving, where there's an openness to the gospel, is, is in a sense the same thing that Paul was doing, is starting where he thought it might be an open door. And then where the doors got closed, he went on. And, um, you know, he didn't give up on a territory until he had done everything he could, but he, he kept finding people who would listen. And I think if you got people who are just going, like, I want nothing to do with this, like, my neighbors across the street closed the door on us so many times, Finally, I'm like, you know, you're our friends and we love you and we'll keep hanging with you, but we're moving on because we, we, we have a reason why we're here. And, um, and you've heard the gospel so many times from me. I can't, I can't keep hanging out with you hoping it'll come to you. Now, the beauty is that they became my best evangelist for everybody else because they're like, hey, you got to meet Jeff. You know, you, know he, he, you might be interested in what he has to say. We're not, but you might be. We really like him. He's our friend, but we don't believe it. Well, they became, they opened new doors for me. And sometimes, like, if you're going into a Muslim community, you might want to go, who's open to talking about a great prophet named Jesus? Well, actually, they are quite open to that, by the way. So if some of it's we got to actually learn how to be smarter missionaries, too. I'd say that's some of the stuff we need to grow in. They're quite evangelistic. You start talking, you try to evangelize them, they see that as an opportunity to invite, evangelize you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When you're casting a vision about MC, what passages do you typically like to, to really focus on? Okay, before I answer that, I want to say one more thing back here. Going to a Muslim community is like going to the God-fearers. 
because they are God-fearers. So we, we, we've got to realize they are in some ways more open to the gospel than the people that ever just want nothing to do with God. And so we tend to make them like, oh, they're a hard people group. I don't know if they're as hard as we think they are. I think they're just different than us. And so we're like, well, you know, we see the, the radical nature of their faith. Well, that's Jesus. That's like going after the zealots in Jesus' day. You know, there's a, sim- there's a similarity in terms of their, they are zealous for what they believe. And so, man, they're already that serious about God. That's, a, that's, that's like the synagogue. It's not Jewish. I don't want to equate it, but it's a similarity in that sense. Whereas I got a bunch of people who are like, I could care less about God. Now, those are harder. You know? So, I mean, I, I would like us to like, even change our diet. Like, a lot of times we think other people of other faith are harder. They're not harder. They're already pressing in. You know? So they definitely don't believe the same things we believe. But great, great open door there, I think. And a huge open door in, in, right now in North America with a, a Muslim context. Really, a lot of people are very open right now. My friends who work with Muslims are just, the, the fruit they're seeing is really great. So in fact, one of mine was, reg, one of my friends was regularly invited to come speak by the imams at their mosque about Jesus. Just open door. He could come anytime he wanted. It's just because he was a wise missionary to them. So. I, there was a, a sorry, yeah. Um, so what passages do I go to? Yeah, so I'll go back and want to explain what, uh, you know, what we're hoping to accomplish, what we're going to do, and just want everyone to see this is clearly taught in Scripture. So where do you see it? First, first Peter 2 would be one of the, First Peter 2 and 3. You know, you are a chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Those are the three identities right there. Chosen people, that's family. Holy nation, that's servant. Royal priesthood, that's missionary. Okay, those are all three of them right there. It's grounded in the very nature of who Israel was. So it's a biblical theology informing this particular way of being mission. And then he says that you were to live amongst the people, you know, that they would, they would, you'd be able to declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his glorious light. And then he says when you live, then he, he describes how you should live in how you work and how you love one another in, in, the, in the area you live in. And then he says in ver- chapter 3, verse 13, I think it is, or 15, always being prepared to give an answer for the hope that's in you. He says, set apart Christ as Lord. So there's this anticipation that you're going to get to tell them now why you're living the way you do amongst them. And that's living your life in such a way that demands a gospel explanation. So I'd say there, I'd say um, uh, all of Ephesians, the whole book, um, pretty hard to get through Ephesians and not come up with some kind of par- paradigm that looks closer to this than what we're presently doing because they're really equipping each other in all of life. Uh, there's a, 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 a kind of a saturation, a universal movement of the church. And I don't have time to unpack all of Ephesians and why I came up with the conclusion, but I'd go there. Um, I don't know how you talk through Corinthians at some point without being able to say, how are we going to exercise the spiritual gifts in a gathering of a thousand, thousand people? You know, prophetic words, healing, tongues, you know, all that stuff. Now, I know that some people are going like, oh, that, that ended, and so you, you're able to walk out and just reject most of, ha- of Corinthians, but you know, get wrestle with that. You know, how are we going to live as God's people in the world where he breaks in with spiritual gifts in a meeting for an hour? It, just doesn't, it can't happen. And then what some people do is they try to make the meeting be the expression of all the spiritual gifts, and it gets really wacky and strange and weird instead of it's on mission. And the, the point of it was those gifts are great, for the mission of the church. That's the point, is that they've been given. So the church goes out, and the signs of the kingdom are with us wherever we go. So I'd, I'd look at that. Um, gosh, there's so many places to go. I mean, I'd look at all of the Gospels and go, how do you come up with what we have now when Jesus spent that much time with 3 and 12 and at the most 70, you know, really together? And sociological studies will tell you that once you get outside of those kinds of numbers, you don't even actually know people anymore. So, like, how would you really do what the scriptures say we should do if you don't really know the people you're with? Um, I, would, I would look at household. Every time there's household. Uh, in Timothy, when he talks about, when Paul's talking to Timothy about what you're going to do with people, whenever um, Paul's writing, look at all the account of the Acts. Look at Paul's letters. He's al- almost always referencing the church that met in the house uh, as well as the city church. He's got two pictures in mind. So, the church in the house was the household, which is probably 20 to 50 people. Um, so, I mean, th- those are some. <laughs> yes. Um, my wife and I have just been so blessed by the everyday people of Soma. I've been just been talking with them and seeing their gospel fluency and how the gospel has just totally changed their life. And 
I know that that's, as you're teaching this, that that's through that MC level that they were able to really flesh it out through repetition and everything. But this question I have is, you know, as, you, as you've worked with so many different people of different denominations, you know, and I think a lot of us here are new church planners, what about in, the, in existing churches that are currently, like, in the traditional paradigms? How do you coach them through, like, you know, the, the stages of what you just taught? You know, what are... How do you transition a tr traditional church is the question. Yeah. yeah, and then I'm going to take a break, by the way. So this will be the last one. Then we'll, um, did you have a, you had one more question too. Just, maybe I'll be able to hit yours and then we'll take a break. Okay. okay. That's pretty easy. Okay. <laughs> so basically, um, the leaders have to repent first. So if there's no repentance, there's no change. And I, I'm amazed at how many people want to adopt a new program but not acknowledge their, their rebellion against God. So... It's not a programmatic shift. It's a heart shift. Yeah. And so churches need to acknowledge where they have not been faithful and obedient to God's commands. And it doesn't mean like, I mean, I, I repent all the time. If people know me, like I'm screwing up a lot. And so we have a culture here at Soma where it's like probably every four to six months, the elders are going to come up and repent of something else that we've done wrong. And, and there's a culture here of we know that's the reality who we are. We're broken. And so we need God's grace. And we're going to keep learning forward. So I think leaders start by repenting. They have to get on the same page. If the leadership isn't unified, you won't lead the church to it. And I know a lot of people who are like the one leader believes in it and the rest of them don't. That's a divided church. So you've got to, get, you've got to read, your word, read the word together and really wrestle with what does the Bible say the church is supposed to be and be willing to put everything that we know on the shelf. You know, I, I, I love Francis Chan because he's a little radical on this kind of stuff, you know, and every once in a while I'm like, Okay, Francis, you can't just throw out church history. I mean, there are some things we've got to pay attention to what happened, but, but he's just like, forget everything. Just read your Bible and do what it says. And there's a part of that that's so refreshing because you're like, is it possible? Now, it's impossible to do what he says because you can't not read the Bible with your paradigm. That's the hardest work. So what I was teaching our class yesterday is you always approach the Bible and, and you do ice to Jesus even if you don't believe it, which means you're putting your meaning out of the text. You always do it. So the work you've got to do is you've got to actually say, what about what we believe is actually what we have adopted because of culture and history and pragmatics and whatever. And if you're willing to acknowledge all those things that are not biblically commanded and specific, then you're able to start to have a conversation. So if you say like a gathering for an hour on Sunday is a cultural thing, not a biblical thing. Now they met on the, the first day of the week because it was resurrection. But I guarantee you, they, they were working. They had still had to work. You know, so what, how does that look? They didn't get Sunday off. They had Saturday off. So, like, like we, so even having them do that kind of work to say, what are we bought into that was never in the Bible? It just was our culture forming our understanding of church. That, that's what repentance is, is saying, what about this have we bought into that? There was never really God's commands. It just was a cultural expression. It's not evil, but when you've made it the only way, it is evil. Because it's called methodolatry. You worship your method now instead of the God who can use any method he wants. So do some repentance, get on the same page, which means some, some combined study so there's uni unity. And then the leaders have got to lead by example. So they've got to get out and be gospel people. They've got to make disciples who make disciples. If they are feel called to missional communities, they've got to be the front leaders of doing that. So they're out making mistakes and struggling like everybody else is going to have to do eventually. And you just follow good leadership principles, and that is follow us as we follow Christ in this issue. And then, then start to redirect resources as a church towards the organ you believe is supposed to support the body. So presently, most churches are giving all their resources towards Sunday. What if they took some of those resources and redirected them to the organ they think is the right organ? So in other words, like a lot of churches will make a mistake. They'll cut off. They'll just get rid of everything and start all over. You just killed your church. Like, when you do organ transplant, you don't go, let's take out all the organs of the body and put all new ones in. You don't. You take out one at a time. And you, and you, but you keep the support. You don't get rid of the heart when you're doing a liver transplant because you're going to die. But if you have to do a heart transplant or a new heart, you're going to have to keep those lungs moving and everything else to support the new heart that's going to go in. So I usually counsel people, don't get rid of all your organs Keep your supporting organs. So if Sunday is still a supporting organ for the whole movement of the church, keep it because the way they communicate, the way that you call people to stuff, the way that you encourage, but you're going to have to introduce a new organ. And when you introduce that new organ, because it's a new organ, like 
missional community, it's going to need much more support than this organ. Because this organ is used to operating on itself. So start to give more and more of your energies, your leadership, your finances, your focus to this organ. And, you're, and the, it's counterintuitive because we're like, why would we put that much energy and money into one missional community? Or three, for that matter, when we're a church of 400 and we got all these small groups and everything else. Well, what you're telling everybody is that thing's going to live. And we're going to give it everything it needs to get the support and the encouragement. And we're telling people what we value now by where our money and time and energy goes. So you have to start shifting. And then you've got to give permission to people who are in that missional community to, to say no to all the other stuff they used to have to do. Like I was just coaching our Federal Way group uh, as they're going to be leaving Tacoma. And I said, you guys have to know you have permission to stop doing everything in Tacoma so you can actually get on mission in Federal Way. So that means we, aren't gonna, we can't be asking you to serve in children's ministry and you know, whatever else it is. If you're going to get on mission there more and more, we've got to remove the barriers of mission for you. Just like you would if you're sending someone to another part of the world. You wouldn't go, hey, I know you're going to be in Papua New Guinea, but I want you to fly back every Sunday for worship. No, you release them for the mission. So you start, you start letting people be free of the requirements they used to be required to do in your old church paradigm so they can give the best of their energy to the new. Now, that's, that's a quick version. I mean, I, I do a whole session on how trans, transition to church. Sometimes I'll do days of this with people, but that's my short version. In what context have you done that? Like just over a conference or like individual coaching? I, I help, I've uh, helped some churches over the period of three years transition. And I usually tell them it's a minimum three-year process. Oftentimes it's three to five years. Yeah, I can tell you, we've been doing the same exact thing, take one organ out, move into the next that's the only way to like start, save my job from getting thrown out. And it's taken us six to seven years to finally get to this point where we're going to actually start putting this into practice. Yeah. So that's my organ transplant analogy. There's also a yeast analogy, which is a kingdom understanding of putting something in that affects the whole. And the yeast is make sure that one missional community that's doing really, really well gets to gossip to the whole church. And you tell them, you keep spreading the good news of everything God's doing so everybody's jealous that they don't get to be a part of what you're getting to be a part of. And then you get them up front, and you have them share their stories, and the leaders are all doing the same thing. And so all of a sudden, all of a sudden everyone realizes, okay, the whole church is going in this direction because all the leaders are doing it. That's all we ever talk about around here. It's what we celebrate. It's what people love. It's where all the best new stuff is happening. It's like, man, who doesn't want to be a part of that? So you, you, that's, what you, that's the yeast idea. So it kind of works itself through the whole dough, dough and changes the whole church. Okay? And your question then will end. Um, you, I, I'm just a little bit confused on your definition of discipleship, um, where a disciple worshiping in all of life, um, changing all of life, and obeying and teaching Jesus in all of life, and compare that to family servant missionary. Mm-hmm. What are those? Because I, the way it was presented first, I thought you were saying disciple, we're defining who we are, not what we do. Right. So I'm just confused on terms of like... Right, yeah, thank you. Um, so remember when I started off and I said the Great Commission says they, they found... So you, Matthew 4, they followed him, which meant they worshipped him. Okay? Worshipper is an identity. You do worship. The, the difference is now we're worshiping Jesus instead of something else. So it's just saying now, now what kind of worshipper are you? That's what that is. Um, I'll make you... That's our, our family missionary servant identity. Okay? So when we worship him, that's our upward. It, now we realize we have a father, a king, and an empowering spirit, which changes our identity. That's our baptismal identity. So we're being changed by Jesus. That's the new identity. So now we're children of God, sent missionaries, servants of our king. And then um, fishers of men... That's where I would put all the, the rhythms if we're going to categorize it. This is obeying him in all of life in light of who we are, in light of what he's done. So this is the who is God, what has he done for us, who are we in Christ, and how do we live. That's basically those categories. I'm just now putting it all together in one statement. Right, yeah. I'm just to synthesize all that. Yeah. Sorry, I, just, I mean, I... That's the hard thing with like trying to get this done in a little bit of time. I'm trying to give you a systematic that gets stated in several different ways. Okay? Wait, what does your last one say? 
Fishers of men. Sorry, I didn't write men. Fishers of me. <laughs> so I will make, make you. Follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. They worshiped him. Make you baptize in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Fishers of men, teach them to obey everything I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always at the end of the age. That's the obedience in all of life, working it out in the everyday stuff. Versus what I think a lot of people do is obedience equates to read your Bible, pray, go to church, give. Well, like we've identified like certain things that they should obey. Instead of when Jesus talks obedience, it's all of life. So that's just me categorizing it. And if, it, if I keep doing this, I could write a quadrants and I could, some of you guys would be, love how far I can go with this. I'm just trying to make it as simple as I can. 